future. And then the images of the future started becoming like horrible, you know, like this horrible kind of Mad Max uh, environment where you're going to be like uh, kind of with a mask and everything. So that did was a wake up call. And another one that was started in the 80s, which we're seeing the consequences now, was another slogan that was like the small... Uh, a smaller family leaves better. So it was a program to try to push uh, people to have only two kids, like just two kids. Right. Four, uh, four, uh, four in a family is more than enough to try to, you know, have birth control and things like that. And that was also a policy that worked uh, when you see that in the long term. Attention all citizens of the future. Buckle up and step into our time tunnel of imagination to join us on an extraordinary journey into the days of futures past. Remember those flying cars and space rockets, the robot maids and cities on Mars that dazzled your childhood dreams of life beyond? This, my friends, is where our adventure begins. So let's go to our guide, that excavator of the eventual, that historian of the hereafter, that recorder of retro futures, Theo Priestley. Hello and welcome to another episode of Days of Futures Past, where I get to chat with a guest around science fiction and visions of the future that they experienced as a child and that inspired them to this day. Today I have with me Mercedes Baltazar. Mercedes is an international expert specialising in futuristic design that combines foresight strategies, narratives and visions of the future to resolve problems that can change the world. She's also a co-editor of Perspectives with the Journal of Future Studies. Mercedes, thank you for joining me today. Hi, Theo. Hello, everybody from Mexico City. It must be fab being in Mexico right now, surely. It is. It is. It's quite a time to be here. We became like a fashion icon uh, since the pandemic. So everybody is uh, wanting to come, which is very interesting. They're discovering us, even though we have been here for ever. <laughs> <laughs> I was going to say, because like Mexico is steeped in... Uh, history, lore, architecture and things. So it's always going to be a, a a bucket list destination, surely. But I'm really glad that obviously during the pandemic, people have decided to seek it out. Was there a specific reason um, for that? Digital nomads, I would say. And um, people who started working remotely and figured out that it was better to be working um, elsewhere with mm. different views and, you know, this... Uh, pandemic uh, way of thinking that changed a little bit of how people saw their way of working and their way of living and then it kind of remained like between the digital nomads that are still here some people decided to stay and then there's also that we appeared in every single guide so uh, now it's between tourists and people that decide to live here it's a great place to, to be in for some people that don't have like a lot of knowledge, it's mm -hmm. impressive to realize that you can get a little bit of everything. So it's a city that's vibrant, that is, uh, you know, that it's kind of like every big city in the world. So that comes as a surprise for some people that come from abroad. So you study, well, well you practice foresight and uh, um, and it's not, it's, it's something that, you know, Mexico doesn't, doesn't immediately spring to mind. You know, when people discuss foresight and, and strategy and things like that, I mean, how does how does how does the local sort of um, I guess the corporates and and the business culture there? How does that um, approach foresight, and is it is it welcomed there? Well, it's starting to be. Um, I think that for the past, I would say probably the program that I studied is about to turn. Um, 10 years, I think, this year. So okay. it's uh, it has started little by little, uh, you know, combined with some people doing strategy and some people doing design. But lately, there's a need for two, because of two things. One, the reduction of uncertainty. Like mm. before, I would say before 2020, so, some things were thought to be like business as usual. The pandemic definitely forced us to see that this certainty illusion is not a thing and we're always uh, in between 
uncertainties. But I have to say that before like studying actually uh, foresight, I was working in crisis management, which is also a way of seeing the future, but only with uh, a prevention glasses. So you're not mm. looking for more opportunities, but a little bit more of how to prevent risks and how to avoid crisis and how to manage them correctly, which in a way uh, it's rooted also in the anticip anticipation mindset. So I think that also companies are moving a little bit more from, yes, this prevention, but also looking at opportunities because they have to change and adapt fast, not only because of things like the, a pandemic, but mm. also because all of the challenges that we are facing around climate change, uh, mobility. Um, I'm working, for example, with a project that's very interesting right now that is building uh, like an apartment uh, complex, but now with a different mindset. So it's uh, a project that will be finished by 2050. But right now they're doing, okay, how do we approach? Because things are changing. There are se mm. several forces that are changing. For example, something that for us is hard to like hold is that the size of the family is uh, becoming smaller. So we're having less kids. We are that this na notion of the big Mexican family is not the same because it's like, OK, now we have dogs or we have uh, a, a different way of, of relating with the family. And that impacts how we live, how we consume, how we buy everything. And in here, it's very interesting because before the 90s. There were a lot of cultural elements that kind of like we came together because we were a closed economy. So mm. that meant that the TV that we watched was kind of the same that the one our parents watched. The um, What we could buy was also kind of like in a very simple way. But after NAFTA, things started changing a lot. And now we are in the same rhythm that any global economy. And that means fast pace, <laughs> as, mm. as you all know. So now we, you realize as a company that you need to adapt. Because it's the global fast pace, but with like a Mexican flavor. <laughs> do, you, do you think then that, um, so you've talked about obviously preparation and you've talked about thinking about opportunities. You know, and I, I read a, a comment that you made on LinkedIn about um, you, you, you had a concern around the potential of having homogenous and quick insights to predict instead of thinking in systems and deeper deeper analysis. So do you think there's a, a tendency for businesses to just chase trends and hope that that leads them to some kind of opportunity and foresight thinking? Yes, and there's like this, you know, there's this season of trend reports and mm. I always find them very funny because it's like a wave. So this is the year of AI. And everything is going to be AI. And just like last year was the year of metaverse and everything was going to be in the metaverse. And sometimes when you hear these buzzwords and you are in a C-level position, it's like, what's this and what am I missing? So it comes like a corporate fear of missing out. Hmm. And doing those changes, that it's a trend that potentially is not going to be like the future in the near future. <laughs> like I'm not saying AI or the metaverse are not going to be a thing, but they're not going to be the thing that's going to, um, you know, change your way of working right now because it requires a lot of one, two, three. Mm. They try to move fast. And this is one of the challenges that I think we're facing is that, okay, I want that, but I want it fast. When changes are, they might seem fast, but they're not as instant as uh, are perceived. And another thing that I'm seeing is this, you know, AI and chat GPT and oh, this is impressive and we just put it there and then it's going to throw us one road. And that for me is the challenge because the future is not one road. It's mm -hmm. That's why we say it futures. It's a broad range of possibilities. And those possibilities are also not uh, a forecast. It's like you're not predicting what's going to happen. You're just showing what could happen. So companies can choose, companies, people, all of us can choose what will be our preferable future and then do something to build it. But it's not something that's just going to come. And I think that's one of the most dangerous perception of a future and where I think that future thinking should be pushing more this narrative of, wait, one, whose future are you buying? 
because um, I remember a couple of years ago when the future was uh, automated logistics. So it was going to be drones delivering every single thing for, uh, you know, Amazon, your supermarket, everything. And I thought, yes, in here, the possibilities of those drones being kidnapped, uh, opened up, robbed, and then mm. being sold into pieces are high because we are not used to that. They're working in LA, for example. I've seen them in LA. Uh, they're very funny. But I don't think that's something that's going to be applicable here. So instead yeah. of figuring out how you're going to do this for your company, figure out what's going to be like the next step for the cultural context in, in which you are working, because there are a lot of things that are different. And there uh, you have to consider, you know, the, the context, the age of the population. I, I just can't imagine my parents receiving an automated um, drone and having to open it or, you know, go, going up and down hills, the distances. Mm. Like it, you have to consider all of this before choosing what you're going to be building for the future instead of this is it. This is what you need and this is what everybody is doing. And I think that's one of the things that you could say science fiction makes you believe like, okay, this is the future for everybody. And it's mm. never the same future for everybody. Right now we are living in different phases of future and it's the present for others. Yeah, I want to pick up on a couple of points. So one, yes, I think people overestimate the pace of change sometimes, especially in the corporate world, because, you know, I still come across businesses that are still using um, brown paper and sticky notes to draw process maps, for example. And yet everybody is 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 saying, oh, but we're all automating, like you say, you know, it's all automation. Um, but the other thing I want to pick up is is your point about different cultures. And, it, and and whose future are you buying? Because it does seem to be a very Western philosophical future that seems to be uh, pushed in, in, in a sense. So it's the, the Western philosophy about capitalism, etc. It's Western-based technologies almost certainly run out of um, Silicon Valley or the US. So it, all, so it all has to have, you know, like you say, we've got drones or we've got little um, robots that are scurrying around and things. And... and Similar to you, I can't see, uh, you know, flying drones in my city in Edinburgh or or um, flying taxis because we just we just don't have the architecture and we don't have the city for it. So do you find that when people think about the future, they don't generally tend to take into account cultural impacts and influences broadly and it's always just that kind of oh well it's all driven by technology so we should we must think around the technology rather than think around the people i think that's a temptation especially because there's this idea that future equals tech hmm. so it's like uh last week when the vision pro arrived and it was like this was the future so everybody is going to be with the glasses and what's going to bring and, you know, all of, all of these concerns. And it could be one. Like, yes, it, it opens up a certain possibility of how tech is going to be uh, applied, but not for everybody. Like, mm -hmm. that's not going to be the general future for everybody because there are different elements. And on the other side, I'm seeing, uh, you know, working or, or in contact with other futurists that are doing work in either the US or Europe that are realizing that they want a future that's similar to our present. So I was in a session and they were talking about this trend about living close to your friends and family. So that the future will be figuring out how to live close to your friends and family. And I was telling them that sounds very interesting, but that's our present here. Like when you <laughs> talk about like here, it's very, we don't have this tradition of moving very far away from our families, or we don't have this tradition of just like, well, oh, I'm moving for work to this state and I'm not like seeing my friends anymore. We, we, that's like how our culture works. So it's very interesting that for you, that will be a change in the future, while for us is a regular thing. Like it's just something that's already happening. Yeah. And I think that's where the culture, and this is some, some, this brings some challenges to corporations when they try to apply certain things that work in, I don't know, I'm going to put like an extreme example. Policies or things that work in Sweden are definitely not going to work in Latin America mm. and vice versa. 
So it's um, you have to acknowledge what's happening in the culture that you're working in and how some things can be uh, applied or if you're creating a different problem that by trying to solve it. So it's like with this um, idea of just a digital government, you know, like because you have Estonia that is completely digital and you don't need a document for anything and everything is like run through this digital government. Yeah, applying here, that here will be a terrible mistake because you have people that barely know how to use the cell phone for more than WhatsApp. And that is just like it. So mm -hmm. if you require to do all your uh, process to get like an ID on a complex platform is going to be a mess and you're going to lose a lot of things because people are not going to be able to do it. So I, I think that's very in important to add that as a layer of analysis. It, it almost sounds like um, some of the futures that we want to push towards become less inclusive. Um, and we, we, I think in, in terms of trying to accelerate towards that future, we're quite happy to leave people behind because it's almost like, well, if you can't keep up, then you're not part of the future. Whereas in fact, you know, everybody needs to live in the future at some point, you know, that, that, you know, you don't just remain in the past. Time doesn't stop. So um, it's, you know, it, it's good points that you make. And I, th I just think that, you know, some of the comments and, and some of the reports that I read um, written by corporates, written by futurists, written by, you know, influencers and pundits all seem to sort of shadow the same kind of thought process, which is, you know, if you're not part of this, you're left behind. Um, and certainly, like, you know, when you when you talk about Estonia here in the UK, obviously, we closed all the branches in, you know, in terms of banking. Um, and you only had a, a few that were left open and everybody's trying to force you to use digital current, not digital currencies, but digital apps to pay for things. And of course, I still see people wandering about with a purse, counting out change and, and not wanting to buy things online. My mum doesn't want to buy anything online because but she doesn't, she doesn't put, it's not that she's not savvy. She just doesn't want to. It's just that a mentality thing, you know, it's a mindset shift, but um, the future does, you know, she doesn't want to be, she she wants she likes what she has because it's comfortable and she knows it and she trusts it, um, but she could still be part of the future by adopting other pieces of tech. But it just seems to be like a a blanket thing. If you're not here and now, then we'll leave you behind. Um, so what was it like growing up in in Mexico then? I mean, and and certainly you know when we when we talk about the future, I mean, what led you to being a futurist? There must have been something in your childhood that that kind of sparks your imagination. Well, yes, it was as as I'm an '80s kid, so my first ten years were still in this closed economy environment. That when you think about it, uh, now when I tell my students that are of course in their twenties, they laugh. Because it's like, okay, TV started at 7 and ended around 11. Mm. So between 11 <clears throat> and 7, there was nothing. It was just like nothing. And you only had like two, um, two networks where you could watch cartoons. And that was, and it was in the time and... The reruns there was there were no linear program programming so you could see one episode and then another one it's very weird because there are some Hanna Barbera shows that are very popular here in Mexico one is Top Cat, the Flintstones, okay. and the mm -hmm. Jetsons, and we thought that they like run forever but no there were just two seasons the only thing is that they just keep you know randomly choosing episodes and you were not like aware of that there was a timeline. You mm. were, were just like enjoying even watching the same one over and over again. The same thing with like Looney Tunes. So it was like, oh, this episode that I that I like appeared today, and you never know what's gonna which one is gonna be tomorrow. So <laughs> it was very interesting. And on the other side and on the other network, we had anime. So I would say that the first images of the future that you could see as a kid before the nineties were the Jetsons. Or mm -hmm. uh, Robo, uh, like Messenger Zeta, and you know Dragon Ball. There's like a big fandom here of Dragon Ball because of that. There was another one called Ranma and a Half. Uh, like a lot of anime. 
was mm-hmm. part of like our first visions of you know transformers and this potential tech future so it's a little bit of the sci- science fiction from japan our first uh input <laughs> or the more corporate side of the future that will be the jetsons so it mm. was one thing that was like gonna happen of course were robots another thing that was going to happen was the ability to fly somehow um and the combination between humans and robots was like a thing that you could picture for the, you know, something that could happen in part of your lifespan uh, mm. when you were like in the 80s. Uh, also, because you started to see a lot of improvement in tech that we didn't have before, cell phones. Um, of course, the, when internet arrived was also like, okay, now we are connected to the world. So that was like a very interesting thing. And one of the things that for Mexico became really popular in the 90s before signing the NAFTA was this idea of becoming part of the world. So it's like um, the future was bright Mm. after signing the NAFTA in in the narrative that we were told. So we were going to be able to be like sitting in the table of the world in a way. So it was like opening up to of course, different content. So that way we got, you know, Card Network and these other narratives that arrived as a kid. Uh, another thing that was like part of our future, when, if you were older, was Terminator, Robocop. Um, mm. Like every single image of the future brought by Schwarzenegger was a popular thing here. And Back to the Future, of course, was a big thing here. A big thing. So... Our images were kind of like that, so it's it's like a, I would say like a high, high low tech because it it was tech for very specific things, mm-hmm. and also being part of like the global pop culture uh, more openly. We had some um, exercises, I would say, in in like movies or even some TV shows. But if I would say that if you saw them, they would come more like in the kitsch part of right. the content. So one of the things was like this wrestler, El Santo, he had uh, several movies where he was like a superhero and he fought different, uh, you know, mummies. Um, he has another one with vampires. He has another one that was like outer space. So it was a lot of bit like aliens. So our future kind of in- involves aliens. And there was another show, which was by another comic called Capulina, that he also had some machines to appear and teleport. Uh, so that would be like our images of the future growing up, mm. which were a little bit delayed, I would say, than what you would uh, experiment, experiment like both in Europe or the US. Because we got there a little bit with a lag, probably, mm. I don't know. Um, I don't know if the Jetsons was a thing for millennial kids outside of Latin America. Um, no, but it's interesting that the Jetsons, obviously the, we've had guests on the show who remember the Jetsons and the Flintstones, and obviously they were the same kind of thing, just told in a different way. Um, and the Jetsons were part of like the, the 60s and that kind of sort of atomic future and like you say, flying cars. You know, and then by the time the 80s came, especially in, in sort of the UK and, and, and across Europe, you know, we had different sets of cartoons. So we'd already seen that in the 70s um, and we had moved on. Um, and then, like you say, you know, we had, uh, you know, you had Terminator straight away kind of thing. As soon as it was out, Robocop, Starship Troopers, all those kind of sort of films um of that particular era, Predator and things like that, where the 80s and Alien, obviously, and Star Trek and things, you know, so the 80s were kind of crammed across here. And it's really interesting to 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 hear um, the perspectives of someone who, where it wasn't as, it didn't all come out all at once kind of thing. You basically had it all drip fed um, at different times. Um, and, but it also makes it, sound like a a real melting pot of ideas because you had them at different times. Um, 
you know, you were watching in the eight, you know, in the eighties while we were watching Terminator and things like that, you were still watching, you know, the Jetsons and and things like that. So, did did that delay then? Does does that does that help? Do you think? the culture in terms of ad- adapting or, or certainly understanding what the future could look like and what it doesn't, what you don't want it to look like because you're receiving it late. And so you're, you're almost like, well, we've seen what's happening in other, in other cities and in other countries who went that direction and it's not what we want. So we can actually, we, you have that time to say, no, this isn't for us. We want a different future. Uh, that would have been like amazing. I think that <laughs> uh, one of the things that we have in Mexico is we are very resilient in the present because we have to adjust and adapt uh, quickly to things happening. Mm-hmm. And that makes, uh, makes it a little bit hard to plan ahead and realize certain things. But there was one thing that did help. Um, we were we started growing as, as a city, and, and I'm talking about Mexico City, not the whole country, but we started mm-hmm. growing really fast. And that brought a terrible pollution problem mm-hmm. uh, because the city is also surrounded by mountains. So when it is hot, it becomes like a pot. So um, we started, I remember it was the 90s, late 90s, where there was like a potential acid rain <laughs> and, and you hear about that. So it that really made, was like a big wake up call, like we cannot continue to do this. And that was when some policies started uh, here in, in the city, you know, like it, it was called Hoy no circula, which would be like, you can't circulate now. So certain cars were not able to uh, go out certain days. And it's a program that's still up till now, uh, but now for like older cars. But it started, they started to put measures around one thing that we cannot um, control, which is traffic. We have a Mm. terrible problem because... You know, the city has a lot of movement. People from the suburbs come to work in the city. So it's a 12 million that becomes brother during the weekdays. So that started, you know, that we don't want that future. And then the images of the future started becoming like horrible, you know, like this horrible kind of Mad Max uh, environment where you're going to be like uh, kind of with a mask and everything. So that did was a wake up call. And another one that was started in the 80s, which we're seeing the consequences now, was another slogan that was like, the sm- uh, a smaller family leaves better. So it was a program to try to push uh, people to have only two kids, like just two kids. Right. Four, uh, four, uh, four in a family is more than enough to try to, you know, have birth control and things like that. And that was also a policy that worked uh, when you see that in the long term. Because it was such a powerful slogan that just like, yes, like we're, you're going to leave better if you're a smaller family because you're going to be able to provide better. Mm. And being more conscious, or, conscious around pollution, especially cars. And they tried to do so with the water consumption, but that has been a little bit more difficult. We're facing right now a little bit of a problem. But... Uh, but I would say like the for the pollution in the air, that image of the future was very powerful and it was like, no, we don't want to go there. Mm. And uh, so so to some to some extent then you were actually ahead of other countries, even you know, and other cities, because you were able to take that dystopian kind of picture and actually convince people and put policy in place to prevent it from happening. Whereas we're only just now, you know, especially, you know, in the UK, we've got the, you know, the um, the ULEZ zones, you know, to prevent older cars and more polluting cars back into the city. We've got the same here in, in Edinburgh, but that's 40 years later after you guys have actually considered that and put that in place. Um, to me, that's actually a really good example of foresight practice where the entire city gets behind it as well. Um, and do you, do you think that then that's 
again something that's missing in uh, I guess foresight studies is is the ability to paint those pictures for the public to understand why we need to think about the future. Yeah, and also about how you're putting it. Uh, mm. Because, for example, I see like one of the consequences of the narrative that we have around climate change is that we are doomed. So, yes, there's a segment that connects with that and wants to do something. But there's another one that says, well, if we're doomed... We, what what else can I do? So mm. there's like uh, you have to include some hope. So yes, this is this could be the the dystopian future, but there's a way to not get there, or there's mm. a way to, get to like a middle place because uh, otherwise it's very hard to uh, push change, which is what you want to do because it's not like yes, we are facing you know warming and lack of water and a lot of things that we're actually seeing happening but if you don't change now then yes the dystopian has no other way of happening hmm. but if, if we want to make a change and have a less dystopian future or a different kind of future we should start changing now in the little by little otherwise that's what we're seeing i think that one of the worst uh, mistakes that we society made in the 90s when we started seeing that this was going to be a problem is talking about a problem of the environment or nature because that was hard to connect nature is going to be there the planet is mm. going to be there they're going to be really happy without us the ones that are, have no uh conditions to survive are humans not mm. the planet so it was like i remember cartoons like coming back to the now the 90s cartoons there was a lot of messages around uh, pollution, like reducing pollution, it was very popular here, like the Captain Planet and, you know, the kids mm. that were fighting together. There were even some, there was another show that was a Mexican show with some, like, puppets. And the, the evil one was a guy called Ecoloco, which was, like, a guy that loved to throw trash and contaminate and stuff like that, so they were stopping him. So there were a lot of messages around, uh, you have to protect the planet. But I would say that the narrative should have been you have to protect the conditions for you to live as happily <laughs> as you do, because the planet is going to be OK. Mm. Like, they don't have an issue. Uh, it's it's us. Yeah, that's a, that's a constant um, a battle I have with people who complain about climate change and things like that, is that, it, you know, the planet has survived far worse than human beings you know, I had a giant rock from space hit it and, and it seemed to get out of it fine. Um, although the dinosaurs maybe had a wee bit of a complaint. But, you know, uh, yeah, it's civilization and it's our way of life that, that will change irrevoc irrevocably if we, you know, if we don't alter some of our ways. But you mentioned again, you know, um, Captain Planet and, and other science fiction in, um, you know, growing up in the 90s, you know, what other what other sort of science fiction influences did you experience? And have you got any favourites that you remember? Uh, well, then, for books, I would say uh, also one of the things that it's kind of interesting in, like, our education programme is that literature comes with a very heavy text when you are either in elementary or even high school. So you, it's when you start reading Asimov. And right. <clears throat> uh, like that's when you start like just getting all together. And I would say Alien was also a big, big, big thing here. Uh, and then of course, The Matrix. Hmm. Like The Matrix, I don't know how it was over there, but in here it even become like part of a cultish thing. So everything could be explained through the matrix. Whatever, whatever you try to do was potentially explained through the matrix. Um, but I like more. I'm more about this like dystopian sagas. I really enjoy them a lot. So, um, like growing up, of course, well, Terminator was a thing. Mm. Uh, it was because I think that to the day, Terminator is such a good. Uh, narrative and it's the effects at the time were mind-blowing um like they they it was just like kind of like the first time you saw things that were like super real 
Of course, there was Star Wars, but that mm. is a different category. And I arrived late to Star Wars. So, um, like, I would say Star Wars was part of my more of adult uh, thing. Mm -hmm. But I would say both Alien sagas and after, and this is like not as a kid, but I really, really, really like, um, you know, the Hunger Games. Yeah. The Hunger Games and how like the narrative, the story and everything, I really like it because it's like this kind of like dystopian future could be future could be other place could be whatever but it is like really i really like that it combines uh things that could be doable in a way like when you think about it it's like yeah, yeah. it's not that like it sounds like a little bit out of place but it could be i think it's i think it plays to the fact that yeah, we're, we're almost like a, a couple of degrees away from making it happen because that's human nature. And it, it reminds me of a bit like, um, funnily enough, another Schwarzenegger movie, but also a Stephen King sh uh, um, short story, The Running Man, um, which is, you know, uh, game sh and, you know game shows that have a really horrible dystopian feel to them. Um, it, it, what is it about dystopian science fiction then that you really like? Is it the conflict? Is it the... How thing how bad things could get if we don't make the right choice. I really like how it's like, you know, sounds unbelievable, but then when you just see it, it's like, oh, but yes. Like I think my favorite story is, and I think the picture is just amazing, and not because it was made by a Mexican director, but like everything in that movie for me could be a forecast. It's Children of Men. Children mm. of Men is what combines what I really like about dystopian because it's a little bit of how he, we as humans tend to first go to a very disciplined scenario, uh, trying to like protect ourselves. So our mm -hmm. first impulse is, yes, more rules. So in theory, we want to be free and we want to be like open-minded and inclusive. But as, as soon as things start to go bad, rules so every dystopian world starts with a complex a very strict set of rules gone really bad and mm -hmm. when you see it like i don't know i'm thinking the pandemic and i'm thinking every single a challenge that we face as societies our first thing is rules and and without thinking in the consequences of those rules and then is the lack of hope like it's just society as a whole decides to quit hope because it is what it is. It has mm. run like it is for a long time. And that's what allows the dystopian to continue to uh, evolve. But then you have this character that one way or another has to rediscover hope and tries to make a change and challenges the stat challenge challenging the status quo to turning into something else. So I think that's also a very human nature thing. It's like, okay, when we have nothing else to lose, hope comes back. Mm -hmm. Because, you know, what's the worst thing that could happen? I'm still going to be, like, here in this horrible place. So, uh, and I think that's, I really like them because I think it's the more, um, like, in the realist, like a, a realism theory gone into reality and show, mm -hmm. shown by us in a very uh, clear way. We, we are like that sometimes and we could be that. So it's, uh, but yet hope comes up eventually, somehow. Someone's going to be like, okay, I have to change this. Mm. Do you not feel that, but that we shouldn't wait to the last minute, um, you know, to find that hope and, and we should all actually sort of stand up and say, I don't want this now, you know, enough's enough kind of thing. Totally. I would say totally, because then, uh, I, I like, I'm watching, like, what I'm seeing right now is a lot of, like, I, I watch an environment where we can easily go to paths that we don't want to go, that we mm. know as a fact that are not a good idea. But yet, there's a lot of people that are making that choice because of fear. I think fear and hope are 
the two most powerful things to push the future. It's not even about, you know, like being super optimistic. It's just the hope that things can be better or it can be different. Maybe not mm. better, but different. And the fear that this is the best as, as they can get. So a lot of the decisions are made by this, like this protection, like I don't want to lose this because maybe this is the best that I can get instead of, well, maybe there's another way and maybe, yes, I'm going to lose this, but I'm going to get something else. Most of most, dyst yeah, most dystopian stories though are, are warnings rather than instruction manuals, like I always say. Uh, <laughs> um, yeah. And and so, I, I think I think it's really interesting that you 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 focus more on the dystopian side. Does that help you actually communicate better in terms of telling people the choices that we should avoid? Because this is essentially what it's going to look like. Yes, I would say <laughs> so. And also, um, I, I try to move between the transformation scenario and the collapse scenario. I'm better at, right. at collapse because sometimes it's better, it's it's easier to like <laughs> figure it out, like one thing to the other leads to the other. Uh, but I also think that because fear is such a powerful uh, emotion, we tend to try to avoid collapse at all at all costs, and that sometimes actually takes us to collapse. So it's like. <laughs> Probably by looking at it and embracing it, like, okay, if this happens, what can I do? Opens up more possibilities because you mm. see that it's not like a single road or a single path. And also it's another thing that we've been trying to push a little bit more is, okay, all of them can live at the same time. Mm. So right now we, we are seeing there are places in the world that are in, in a collapse scenario. And there are other ones that are like in this complete growth scenario, but they are also facing other challenges. I was reading a report about uh, depression in Iceland. And they are like in, with horrible numbers on depression and suicide rates. And you would see, like, you would think that that would be like utopia, you know, because they have all this uh, system that has no problems in a way, but the problems mm. show up in a different way perspective, you know, like more yeah. in the individual instead of the collective. So I think that we are living in different, like collapse is already here. Uh, we just have to look it in the eyes and see like what we're doing to either move in that direction or move in a different one. And also there's this uh, idea that growth is what we want, but maybe we should challenge that because growth got us here. <laughs> so, mm. and it's not that growth is bad, but then how are we addressing it? Like growth over growth, oh. it's gonna, you know, we're gonna become too big for the planet and to, to to hold. And that's a problem that we're facing. So, and I think that's also one thing that could help, you know, even the tech companies, like one thing that I'm seeing, and it's a concern for me is like this, uh, you know, deadline for all your uh, appliances. So you cannot fix them three years, they're gone. And then mm. you have to ha every year they have a new one. And it's amazing. And they're just like saying, and this one is more sustainable because it's re it has a reduction in the use of water, blah, blah, blah. And it's like, yes, but you have all this garbage from all the other models that were not as sustainable as this one adding up. So maybe we should stop and think, how can we grow in a way that's not damaging? How can we grow in a way that it's more inclusive? Uh, otherwise, we're going to end up in the collapse as well. Yeah. Yeah, I think growth doesn't also equal an increase in consumption. You can grow, but actually reduce your consumption because you understand what growth means. But like you say, I think there's this push to to expand, to grow, to create bigger bigger economies, but uh, unfortunately, that means that, um, you know, we're consuming more of the planet at the same time. And I think it's, what is it, Earth Day? Is it Earth Day where it um, gets shorter and shorter, where the, the time uh, between the first of the year and the, the time that we, um, we have already reached the capacity 
that we have consumed more than the, 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 the earth can provide kind of thing gets shorter and shorter because we just don't seem to we don't, don't don't seem to want to stop no and there's also like okay growth for whom because i can understand mm. you know like I, I was uh reading i can't remember her name I, you had her on, on her podcast she's from south africa and oh, she was Bronwyn. Saying, oh, yeah Bronwyn. yes like yeah. okay you cannot tell africa as a continent to degrowth because mm, that's yeah. like it's not it's not a thing you know and and when I, I I can say the same for countries in Latin America, it's like the growth is like, well, we are just getting there. Now we now we we don't get to get to the party. But mm. I think the narrative should be like how to grow, because it could it, it is also not ideal for all of us to grow in the same direction. We're seeing that certain growth is not good. Uh, mm. We are seeing like that it requires a different way of growing. It's not about not growing and going back to, you know, the basic stuff, uh, because that's also non-viable. It's, mm. it's, not a, it's not possible. It's not a thing. And it's very hard. It's a story very hard to convince. So it's like, but we also don't want to end up in Elysium, which for me, it's a very powerful <laughs> movie that brings up like, oh, my God. Especially yeah, that's because a great film. Especially because all the collapse part was recorded here in Mexico in the trash dumpsters. So all that oh, exists. was it? Yes. Ah, I always yeah. assumed that it would be. It was filmed um, in South Africa. Of of course, no, because the characters were were Mexican as well. But yeah, yeah Neil yeah. Bloomkamp generally tends to find uh, as dystopian as possible some of the settings and scenarios. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, and it was like in the dumps. Like there was no uh, need to rec recreate everything. That's how they mm. look, and those are the dumpsters of the city, which shows us show us that we have a very big problem with trash, uh, as as like now. It's not in the future. It's now. <laughs> so putting. Um dystopia aside just for one second then were there any visions of the future that you saw as a child or as a teen or even as an adult um that you either read about or watched in a movie that you thought i really wish we could head towards that now that's a very good question i don't know i don't think so <laughs> uh, <laughs> I don't think so, and and I'm gonna blame the part that I'm the daughter of a journalist and um, international affairs major, so I know a lot about wars. But um, no, I think I'm I'm a bit more of I don't know if you've seen years and years. Uh, the no, oh, no, it, no. It's an amazing mini show that aired. Previously to the pandemic, it was uh, from the, it, it's a like a futuristic scenario from 2019 to mm -hmm. 10 years in the future, all in a British family. So all the things right. that happened through them in, in a British family and it was a combination. So I don't know, like positive image of the future as a whole. Hmm. Or any technology that you read or saw and you thought, that looks really cool and I wish I had that now. Yes. I would say um, health tech. Uh, mm. Health tech is something that even in this uh, dystopian scenarios is always an improvement. And I, I, I think one that I like, but it's also dystopian, but I really like that uh, premise was Gattaca mm. and yep. it was definitely not a future that I would like to live in but it was a very interesting way of okay how can we live in this so-called like peaceful and organized uh, society where everything thrives uh, but not really <laughs> like mm. not but not for everyone so, but I would say like all the health tech is, is something that I wish I have now. 
from you know these patches that you can put up and they just grow your organ inside or mm. uh i'm gonna go like again with the matrix i would really love to have this thing that they plug you and now you know things right I would kill to have that. Like, just like here, 15 minutes, I know how to Kung Fu. Perfect. Um, <laughs> well, that might happen if uh, Neuralink and Elon Musk's company, uh, you know, makes good on some of its promises. Yeah, um, yeah. That one that one for me was like, yes, I definitely, definitely like to live here. There was a couple of, there's a couple of interesting ones. So you talk about patches and, and growing things. I think in Star Trek Four. Um, in the voyage home, McCoy gives this old woman who was going through dialysis a pill. It just looks like a sweetie. And then she grew a new kidney, which I thought was fantastic. It was quite a, quite a nice nod there. Um, but going back to Elysium, you know, the whole thing about Elysium, where, which was, you know, the rich people had this fantastic health tech and lived a fantastic life, but they didn't give it to the, um, to the people back on Earth. And of course, one of it was like that sort of tube that you could go in, it would scan you and then almost reconstitute you back to health, which was, you know, incredible tech. But um, like you say, I think I think having that health tech, or having something so amazing, I think would also lead us back to dystopian futures where it's it's there's always going to be the haves and the have nots, which yes. is perfect for science fiction stories, really. And that's what I was trying to see. Like, if, if I would choose, like, a future image would be, like, a more inclusive one, you know? Mm. But then I have this part of me that says, yes, but humanity is not like that. No, <laughs> like, they have never been. <laughs> like, there has never been a moment in time where, you know, it was like, okay, we can chill. Everybody has what they need and what they have, and that's okay. So, and, and that's always the case. Like, even when you think about this perfect environment and that's why i like gattaca because it could seem like a perfect environment mm. for some because there's always going to be someone that is not that or, or there is always going to be someone that is like not uh aligned or that is a mistake or it's like yeah because humans are like that and i think that's also it's not a negative thing to do it's just something to acknowledge it's like yes that's always going to be the challenge i think that that could explain why the matrix as well was so popular because if you right at the beginning um when they were explaining what the matrix was when they actually created the first matrix they made it too perfect and people didn't like it and so they tried to break out and and it failed you know, so you have to have that little bit of dystopia and a little bit of hopelessness for people to accept, oh, well, this is what life is like and, and I'll just carry on rather than, oh, this is too perfect and I don't like it, <laughs> which is obviously another, you know, you become suspicious when it, when things are going your way a little bit too much, really. Yes. <laughs> um, Mercedes, I've really enjoyed this chat. Where can we find out more about you and, and, and the work you do? Well, I, I would say LinkedIn. Um, uh, and for Spanish speaker, I'm also in X as La Marimer. In LinkedIn, you can find me as Mercedes Baltasar. And I try to post regularly. I, sometimes I just miss. Um, but yes, also like in Spanish, for Spanish speaking, I, I have it in LinkedIn. We did a very good exercise lately in a magazine here for that's mm -hmm. a magazine for Mexico City called Chilango. And we did four scenarios of the future of the city in 2040. So it's, unfortunately, it's only in Spanish, but uh, if someone wants to check it out, it came out just like we did all the collapse, the dystopian, the transformation, and the discipline scenario in our hectic, in our already hectic city. I will include the links um, in the show notes um, for all of that. Um, Mercedes, Thank you very much for taking some time today to chat about uh, visions of the future and your science fiction um, loves and this, your love for dystopian science fiction. Dystopian. Yes. <laughs> um, yes. That's it for another episode of Days of Futures Past. Please join me again next time on a, a future episode where we will have another guest talking about visions of the future and the science fiction influences throughout their childhood. Bye for now. This is Days of Futures Past.
signing off when we'll once again peel back the curtain on more lost futures. Stay tuned, and remember, the future may be here, but the past never fades. Until next time. Days of Futures Past was brought to you by Theo Priestley, keynote speaker, author, and retrofuturist. If you'd like to appear as a guest and reminisce about futures gone by, get in touch. I've been your radio host, Andrew Helbig. Goodbye for now.